is. Now, tonight we're going to do things a little bit different, actually something we've never done before in our 20 some odd year history as a church. And we're going to, at least for a moment, abandon our normal approach to our text for the evening. And what we're going to do tonight, uh, at least in the beginning, is just read chapter four. And the reason I say that, obviously chapter four is just uh, a brief 12 verses. But uh, one thing I think we need to recognize, the most important thing we do whenever we gather together in this room or any other is we read the Bible. And we don't want to leave any holes in our study of the book of Samuel. So when we are done, we will have read every single word of every chapter of the book of First and Second Samuel. Now, one of the reasons we're going to do this is because the subject matter and at least part of the content of chapter four is a repeated scene. It's something we've seen before, studied before, know the players are different with the exception of David. The lessons obviously would be the same. Now, the context of chapter four is this. Ishbosheth had received word that uh, Abner had been murdered and he basically falls apart and the rest of the 11 tribes of Israel also share in his alarm. We're going to read that two of his generals, unscrupulous men, who were um, trusted associates, actually betrayed him and came into his own house, most likely under the pretense of gathering wheat to be distributed amongst the people, which was a common procedure of the day. They came into his house and they actually killed him. Now the men cut off his head, brought it to David, thinking they would be rewarded for their deed by the man who was certainly going to be the king over all of Israel. Now, David tells the men, you know, somebody else did this one time. Somebody else came before me and thought they were going to be rewarded because they came to me and they thought they killed my enemy, King Saul, when he was actually the Lord's anointed. They thought they would be rewarded for their deed just like you do, and you will get the same reward they did, and that is execution. Now, back in 2 Samuel 1, 14 to 16, David said uh, to this Amalekite young man, how is it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of the young men and said, go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So David said to him, your blood is on your own head for your own mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Now, Much like we found in our last chapter with the death of Abner, David takes a dim view, or he has no tolerance, so to speak, for cold-blooded murder. And Abner was killed in cold blood, as was Ishbosheth. And here in chapter 4, the two men who murder Ishbosheth by taking advantage of their trusted position under Saul's son, the appointed king by Abner, are meeting the same fate as this Amalekite man we just read of. So would you stand and read with me, please, all of 2 Samuel chapter 4, and then we'll jump in to chapter 5 for our study. 2 Samuel 4, verse 1. When Saul's son heard that Absalom had died in Hebron, he lost heart and all Israel was troubled. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of the troop. The name of one was Benaiah, and the name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Ramon, the Beirothite, of the children of Benjamin, for Beiroth was also part of Benjamin. Because the the Beirothites fled to Gataim, they have been sojourners there until this day. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet, and he was five years old when the news came about Saul and Jonathan from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Then the sons of Ramon, the sons of the, uh, of the uh, Beirothite, Rechab and Beana, set out and came at about the heat of the day to the household of Ishbosheth, who was lying on his bed at noon. And they came there all the way into the house as though to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Beana, uh, Beana, uh, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom. Then they struck him and killed him and beheaded him and took his head and were all night escaping through the plain. 
Then they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron, and he said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life, and the Lord has avenged my lord, the king, this day of Saul and his descendants. But David answered Rechab and Beanna, his brother, the sons of Ramon, the Beirothite, and said to them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adversity, when someone told me, saying, Look, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good news, I arrested him and had him executed in Ziklag, the one who thought I would give him a reward for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous person in his own house on his bed? Therefore shall I not now require his blood at your hand to remove you from the earth? So David commanded his young men, and they executed uh, them, cut off their hands and feet, and hanged them by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner in Hebron. You may be seated. Another very pleasant chapter to go with our first three. Now, interesting to see that David's perspective was the same as he had on Saul and Ishbosheth, though maybe not pursuing to kill David, certainly would be pleased with David, uh, David's demise, even if it was only political or his rulership. David called Ishbosheth righteous, even as he referred to Saul as the Lord's anointed. Now, it's curious that David has Ishbosheth's head buried with Abner in Hebron instead of with his father Saul in Jabesh. Now, not sure what all that implies other than it was actually Abner that appointed Ishbosheth as king. Now, chapter 5 is going to finally move us in to the reign of David as king over all Israel. And the first thing we're going to note is that things instantly begin to turn around when the man after God's own heart, God's choice for the king of Israel, takes his throne. Now, when news of Abner's death reached the 11 tribes, we're told they were troubled. The word means to tremble inwardly. And then at Ishbosheth's death, the nation remembered what was said about David, and then they entered into a covenant with David in Hebron. Now, most scholars believe that when Samuel recognized that David was God's choice for king, he was most likely 15 years old. He was probably 13 years old when he took out the giant or the champion of the Philistines, Goliath. And tonight we're going to be told that David is 30. Now, some say that means he was in his 30s. Others say it's an exact age, and they uh, do so because they like to parallel that with the ministry of Jesus. But David is somewhere around 30. Maybe he's exactly 30. Maybe he's just in his 30s. But the point is, this reminds us of the story of Abram, and we often call her Sarai, her name is actually pronounced Sarai, who were promised that a great nation would come from his loins and her womb. Yet we also know it didn't happen much like David's coronation between his anointing as king had a time span between it. We know that Abram was 100, or Abraham was 100, and Sarah 90, when finally a single child was born to the aged couple. Now, between the promise of descendants in number, like the sands of the sea, or like the stars of the heavens, the birth of the son, uh, between that and the birth of the son, who was going to have uh, a son himself, and then 12 tribes come from his son Jacob, there were some mistakes made along the way by Abraham and Sarah. One of them is still being experienced by the world today as he, uh, Abram had gone into Sarah's handmaid, Hagar the Egyptians, and then through Ishmael uh, came the Arab peoples. And we know the tension between the sons of Isaac and Jacob and those of Ishmael that continues to this day. David made some mistakes between his anointing as king and his actual coronation. And we too live in a time where we also could describe our own situation as being uh, between the promise of heaven and our arrival there. I think today's a great day for the rapture, don't you? Yeah. Now, I think we'd all readily admit, at least to ourselves, that between the declaration and destination, we too have made some mistakes like Abram and Sarai or Sarai and like David. Now, 
Tonight, we need to remember one of the greatest statements of all time made by one of the great sages of the modern era, and his name is a philosopher, or his title is a philosopher, and his name is actually Yogi Berra. And we're going to use one of his rather bizarre statements as our title tonight. And I must first give my apologies to the English teachers out there, uh, both in the room and online. And our title tonight is simply, It Ain't Over Till It's Over. So not when the fat lady sings, it ain't over until it's over. Now, since we're all in the same general situation, we're waiting for the last trump when the dead in Christ rise first, then we who are alive and remain meet them in the air to forever be with the Lord. I thought since we're all sharing that situation, maybe it'd be prudent for us to talk a little more on an individual basis about some of the personal things that go on between the time of promise and fulfillment that we also encounter in various times in our lives. Now, another familiar verse from Isaiah 40, 31 reminds us that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, I don't know that we could say this is our default response when we come into times of waiting on the Lord. Sometimes when living between the declaration and destination, we have trouble maintaining our focus and our eyes on the Lord and therefore a diligent and active hope. Now, in Proverbs 24, 16, we're also reminded that a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Now, I think we've all had times where our time of waiting hasn't renewed our strength, but maybe like Abram and Sarai and David, there have been times where we maybe tried to help God out a little bit, maybe took matters into our own hands because it seemed like the Lord was taking too long. Does anybody know what I'm talking about tonight? Seemed like the Lord his, and his timing was completely different than ours. Maybe some have even doubted. Maybe some have been on the verge of giving up. Well, may I remind you, it ain't over till it's over. And God will be faithful to all of his promises, even if it takes years. I didn't want to say that any more than you wanted to hear it, but it's true. Amen. So let's jump into 2 Samuel 5. Start with verses 1 through 9. Read along with me, please. 2 Samuel 5, 1 to 9. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord and they anointed King David over Israel. Now, David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now David said on that day, <clears throat> Excuse me, whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore, they say the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the Milo and inward. Now, as the representatives from all the uh, 11 tribes, the other tribes outside of Judah, come to David at Hebron, they acknowledge that David is of their bone and flesh. Now, most likely, this is an acknowledgement that David wasn't the defector or the traitor that he was accused of being and even believed to be by Achish, but doubted uh, on the part of the other uh, Philistine princes, as we studied some time ago. We'll mention again 
tonight, but it was just simply an uh, olive branch, so to speak, of acceptance that either it was no longer believed or it was accepted as untrue all along. Now, 1 Chronicles 12, 24 to 37 actually gives us a detailed list of who and how many came to Hebron from each tribe. Now, it's interesting that those who gathered to make David and anoint David as king numbered as 1,222 chiefs from the tribes of Israel and 339,600 valiant men or warriors. Now, they continue their address to David by noting that David was actually the one, even though Saul was king, who led the troops into battle and brought them back home. And then they also acknowledge that the Lord said of David, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Now, it's interesting that they had the same information that Abner had and Saul had. And yet now, after seven years and six months of rule over Judah, the rest of Israel is finally acknowledging what God had said about David. And then you can tack on uh, the other years prior to that when David was first anointed by Samuel. Now, in our time last week, we likened much of David's life to a soap opera. Lots of deceit, drama, scheming, murdering all around him. And we also noted something else, that there's a contrast to in our verse, uh, verse 3 here this evening. Now, back in chapter 3, we found in 3, 12 to 13, Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David saying, whose is this land? He was saying, in essence, it's my land to give. Saying also, make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. And David said, good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Now, the covenant that David made was actually for political advantage. But as we noted last time, there was no mention of prayer. There was no sending for the high priest uh, ephod to wear and consult the uh, Uman and, or Urim and Thuman. And it was no uh, real spiritual decision. It was strictly one uh, that would lead to David's uh, ascending to the throne over the rest of the tribes. Now, we also noted that the end result of this covenant actually led to the murder of Abner. When Joab found out, he had come and made a covenant with David, and David let him slip away and go in peace. Now, in verse 3 of our chapter, this covenant was made before the Lord. In other words, the Lord had been consulted. It was one that the priests would agree with. It was one that was covered in prayer. And this covenant was made between David and the other 11 tribes over all of Israel after seven and a half years of being king over only Judah. Now, after this, things began to turn around for the nation as David and his men went to the city of Jebus. It was later renamed Jerusalem. And the Jebusites respond to David's gathering of his army against them by saying, the blind and the lame can defend this city and you'll never take the stronghold of Mount Zion. Now, David then in turn challenges his own men by saying, whoever can climb the water shaft, and if you've ever been to Israel, some believe that this is what's called the Warren shaft that brought water inside the walls of the city. Whoever can climb the water shaft and attack and defeat the lame and blind defenders who have insulted David down to his soul, that's the meaning of David uh, hating them from his soul, shall be made a chief and a captain. Now, we were introduced to the character who would actually bring this about last time. And in 1 Chronicles 11, 4 to 9, we're told that all and David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. But the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, you shall not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David said, whoever attacks the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain and, what's the guy's name? Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went up first and became chief. Then David dwelt in the stronghold, therefore they called it the city of David, and he built the city around it from the Milo to the surrounding area. Joab repaired the rest of the city, so David went on and became great, here's why, 
and the Lord of hosts, or Lord of armies, was with him. Now, this is the same Joab that David had spoken a curse over for the murder of Abner. And yet, Joab remains loyal to David. He meets the king's challenge. He climbs the water shaft, and then Israel takes the city. David called Jebus the city of David, and the city began to grow. The city began to prosper as Israel entered into a great season of victory under their new king and prosperity as well. Now, in case you're wondering what the Milo is, it actually means the landfill, and it was simply an area that was leveled off in order to accommodate the expansion of the city on the hill. So, after years of being pursued by Saul, after living in caves in the wilderness, after a stint in enemy territory, and then seven years and six months as king over his own, uh, only over his own familial tribe, David is finally king over all Israel as the Lord had promised him some 15 years plus earlier. Now, this reminds us that it ain't over till it's over, but here's our first point. Listen tonight, we know God will always keep his word, but not always how. We know that God will always keep his word, somebody say amen, amen. but not always how. And one, obviously we have the adage that God moves in mysterious ways, and indeed he does, and he does things past finding out. His ways are not ours, his timing is not ours, his ways are past finding out, yet he does wonders without number. Now, David was going to be king over all Israel, being pursued by Saul, playing a madman in Gath, living in Philistine territory, and only being king over one tribe for seven and a half years was probably not on David's radar as to how this whole thing was going to play out. Now, for you and I, Hebrews 10.23 reminds us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without what? Without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, times of waiting can lead to times of wavering, as they did with Abram and Sarai and David. Even as we know that God is and will be faithful, for he cannot deny his own character and nature. Now, in Psalm 910, we're reminded that those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. God does not leave us nor forsake us, does he? And even though his timing may be bizarre, even though it may be something that we can't understand in our finite thinking, God is faithful and God will not ever allow any portion of his word to, to remain unfulfilled, even though his timing may be distinct from ours. Now listen, as a church, we're waiting either for the Lord to take us all home together. Yep. Amen. I vote for that first, don't you? Or to a new home as a church body. And listen, in the waiting time, we cannot waver. We have to remember that he will never leave nor forsake us. He is the Lord who provides. He does make ways in the wilderness. He does make the path straight and the gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. Now, we're somewhere between the declaration and destination as individuals and as a corporate church body. And what we do know is that God will be faithful to his word and his promises even though we can't see how. Now, here's the last thing I want you to remember before we move on. And this is something we all need to remember, we all need to apply in our own seasons of waiting, and it just says, listen, you don't have to see progress for God to be moving. God is never inactive. He never sleeps nor slumbers. He is always working. He is always protecting. He is always providing. He is always watching out for us. His arm is not short that he can't reach us. His ear is not heavy that he doesn't hear us. God is on the move on your behalf and mine right now, every day and all the time. And he's moving on behalf of CCT as well. Somebody say, amen. amen. Now, Let's keep moving and look at verses 10 to 16. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. 
Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he had come from Hebron. Also more sons and daughters were born to David. Now, these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, uh, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, or Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphalet. Now, there's a group of tongue twisters for us. Now, David's capture, expansion, and habitation of Jerusalem made it clear to all Israel and the surrounding peoples that God was with him. He wasn't just some random renegade tribal chieftain as uh, recent uh, Bible deniers have tried to cite that he and his son Solomon were just nothing more than random warlords uh, who were Bedouin in their nature. David had a city that was called the city of David, and it is the city of kings, and it is the city the king of kings is going to rule from some day not too far in the distance, I believe. But this is evidenced by the recognition he received from Hiram, the king of the Phoenician city-state of Tyre. He provided materials and men to build David a palace, also recorded in 1 Kings 5, 1 through 11. Now, the relationship between King Hiram and Israel extended into the time and the reign of Solomon as he also supplied materials for the building of the first temple or the house of the Lord. Now, here's another point of interest in Ezekiel 26, 1 to 6. We're told it came to pass in the 11th year on the first day of the month that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, aha, she is broken who was the gateway of the people. She is now turned over to me. I shall be filled. She is laid waste. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like a top of a rock. It shall be a place for spreading nets in, in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. It shall become plunder for the nations. Also her daughter villages, which are in the field, shall be slain by the sword. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, Hiram was known for his merchant ships that would carry spices and goods into the Middle East and uh, bring them also into Phoenicia, which is geographically at least modern day Lebanon and into the rest of the region. And yet time, by the time of Ezekiel, some four centuries later, they sought to overtake Israel instead of blessing Israel. And we can see uh, uh, Genesis 12, 3 coming into play here. When Hiram was blessing Israel, his nation and people were blessed as well. When they turned on Israel, God said, well, I'm going to make you like a flat rock where people dry their Nets. And indeed, we know that Reve uh, Revelation Genesis 12, 3 is still intact today. And that's why we want to be a blessing to the nation of Israel and the Jews. Amen. Now, it'd be nice if the narrative ended there, but it doesn't. The Lord of hosts having been with David and by that David being recognized as a pagan king and the valid king over all Israel. That'd be a nice place to cut the chapter off. After knowing the Lord had established him as king over all the land, having exalted his kingdom for the sake of God's people, Israel, David takes another moral nosedive and succumbs to the cultural norms of the day and again disregards a clear mandate for kings from the Lord. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, Speaking of the time when the Lord would place a king over Israel, the Lord said of this king through Moses, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now, in the ancient Near East, one of the signs of being a great king was the acquisition of a large harem. And though David's actions in this respect 
cannot and should not be defended and eventually would bring him countless sorrows, he nonetheless followed the custom of the day instead of the immutable word of God. Now, with that said, the names that David assigns to his own sons are kind of interesting. Shamua means renowned. Shobab means rebellious. Nathan means given. Solomon means peace. Ibhar means Jehovah chooses. Elishua means God of supplication. Nepheg means to spring forth. Jephiah means bright or shining. Elisha means my God has heard. Eliada means God knows. Eliphalet means God of deliverance. Very lofty names David assigned to his sons. And without much difficulty, we can see the gospel message woven in the names of these sons. If you link them all together with a little help uh, from the English language, in essence, what the list says is the renowned and rebellious are given peace by God's choosing. He is the God of supplication and allows us to spring forth in brightness like the noonday sun, for God knows God hears and God delivers. David named his kids wisely, even though he had kids through disobedience. Now, here's our takeaway for living in such a time as this. Something we've said before in other ways, something we need to be reminded of frequently, especially in this day and age, and especially living in the state of California. Listen this evening. We will better impact the world by walking in God's ways, not theirs. We will better impact the world by walking in God's ways, not theirs. Now, we've studied in our word blessing that the blessings of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. David's decision uh, to increase his harem and therefore uh, go along with the cultural trends of the day brought many sorrows to him down the road. Now, one thing I thought was interesting in light of him naming his sons in this beautiful way, I think we need to recognize there are people today who are putting new names on disobedience, much like David tagged his sons with these wonderful monikers, even though they were born out of his direct disobedience to God's command. We're hearing a lot of terms today used even within the church, like inclusive, which the word actually ought to be rejection, a rejection of God's word. Some today are using the word affirming, when the right word should actually be offending, offending God and standing against his word, as we're told in Romans chapter one, would be the natural end of my digression when you begin to deny that God is creator. But here's the good news. Who needs some good news tonight? Among this list is Solomon. And in Solomon, we see the wonderful mercy and grace of God. Solomon was the son born to David and Bathsheba after their first son, died as a child, the son of their union when Uriah the Hittite was off to war fighting on behalf of King David. And David spied Bathsheba bathing on the roof and sent for her and brought him to himself. And she became pregnant after their encounter. And the Lord said, you shall not die, David, but the son born to you is going to die. And I believe that was an act of mercy where God spared this young child, the shame and mockery he would have experienced in life when it was known and it did become known what David had done. Now in 2 Samuel 12, 24 to 25, we're told that David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. This is after the death of their son. And he went into her and lay with her and she bore a son and he called his name what? Solomon. Now the Lord loved him and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now, Jedidiah was a nickname, much like the nickname or title assigned to Abraham as a friend of God or David as a man after God's own heart. It just means beloved of Jehovah. So after all that David done, the Lord sets his love on this young boy as he is born. And in Nehemiah 9, 16 to 17, in one of the great prayers of the Old Testament, uh, Ezra and Daniel 9 being the other two. Nehemiah, speaking about their ancestors, says they and their fathers, or our fathers acted proudly, 
hardened their necks and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks, a phrase associated with stubbornness. And in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Somebody say amen tonight. Now, David, in this current situation, even though the Lord had blessed him so greatly, was being more influenced by culture in the world than he should have. God's directive to the future kings of Israel wasn't cryptic. It didn't need any interpretation. It didn't need an establishing of context. God said, the king shall not multiply wives or silver and gold. Now, the same is true with the things many are renaming today. But even as with Israel in the wilderness, and they're not heeding of God's commands, God is still God. He is still gracious and he is still merciful. He is ready to pardon. He's still slow to anger. He's still abundant in kindness. And when we have allowed the world to influence us more than we have influenced them, he does not forsake us as is evidenced by his love for Solomon and his people, Israel. It ain't over when it's over, until it's over. And when we fall, we can get up. When we forget God's word, we can get right back under its promises and provisions as God is still ready to pardon. God is still gracious. God is still slow to anger. And God is still abundant in kindness. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Now let's look at 17 to 25 and wrap up. Uh, this chapter. Now, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David, and David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And they left their images there, and David and his men carried them away. Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim, Therefore, David inquired of the Lord and said, You shall not go up, circle around behind them, and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. Then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you and strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Now, it's safe to assume that the four Philistine princes who told Achish to send David home when David joined the military parade and feigned his alliance with them, I'm sure they were sure to remind Achish how David made him think he was on his side, as evidenced by 1 Samuel 27, 12, where Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him, therefore he will be my servant forever." And obviously, Achish would have been, as we would say, hopping mad when he found out David was actually not just king over uh, Judah, but now king over the whole land of Israel. And upon the news of his coronation, the manhunt begins for Israel's new king. The Philistines deployed themselves in the valley of the giants. And that's what Rephaim means. Due south of Jerusalem, David inquired of the Lord, should he go up against them? The Lord said, go, for I will without a doubt deliver them into your hand. And then David defeats them at a place he calls Baal Perazim, which means the Lord who breaks through. Our God is a God of breakthroughs. Amen. Now, verse 21 is also of interest as we remember that the Philistines carried away the Ark of the Covenant after defeating Israel, after Israel carried the Ark into battle assuming that the ark would assure their victory. Here the Philistines do the same thing. They carry their images into the battle and David carries them away after their defeat. Now some translations read that David took them and burned them, which is likely so. 
Now, the Philistines regroup in the Valley of Giants for a second engagement. David does not assume that the last answer was the same answer that he would have this time. As he relates the situation to the Lord, he petitions the Lord again. The Lord says, don't go straight up. Don't meet them head on, but rather circle in behind them. And when you hear the sound of marching on the tops of the mulberry trees, attack quickly. David did what the Lord commanded. The Lord was faithful. The Philistines were driven back all the way to Gezer, which was some 15 miles away. Now, some rabbis have taught that the sound of angels walking on the top of mulberry trees is what is in view here. It was a sign that the cherubim of God were actually going before David's army into battle. And when David heard the engagement of the cherubim, he was to immediately engage the enemy with his forces. Now, David did as the Lord commanded. And those who once defeated Israel and carried away the ark of God the Ark of the Covenant of God, were soundly defeated. And David was firmly established, not just as king over Israel, but he was established as king over Israel by his friendly neighboring kings, as well as in the eyes of his enemy. Now, thinking back on all the things that have happened along the way that we studied in 1 Samuel and our first few chapters of 2 Samuel, and how David finally arrives at this moment, how the nation is back under the hand of God's blessing, being reminded it ain't over till it's over. And thus our closing observation is this. Listen tonight. God still delivers and directs through supernatural means. God still delivers and directs through supernatural means. Now it's probable, maybe even likely, that the Philistines had figured out David's battle strategy coming straight up at them, and they thought they'd concocted a plan to defeat him, and thus the Lord changed the battle approach. And through this miraculous signal, David was told to go up and attack. Now, I want to remind us all of a couple of things here tonight as we close. If you remember, it wasn't until the Israelites were pinned against the Red Sea that the Red Sea parted. It wasn't until the Israelites were thirsty that the rocket Meribah was struck and water was given to the people. It wasn't until God's people were hungry that the Lord sent manna from heaven. When Israel needed directions in the wilderness, God gave them a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And when the shepherds needed to find Jesus, God created an unusually bright star that was used to guide them. Now, moving forward a bit, let me remind you that a lame man was healed by Jesus because he was lame. A blind man was healed by Jesus because he was blind. Chains fall, fell off of Peter because he was chained and in prison. Ten lepers were cleansed because they had leprosy. Lazarus was raised from the dead because he was dead. I think you're getting the point. Now, listen, here's where I think we need to wind up tonight. God doesn't do performance miracles. He doesn't perform for mankind. He's not doing tricks magic tricks or anything like that. God does necessary miracles. And when one is needed, either deliverance or direction, he can still do what he has always done for his chosen people, and that is operate in the realm of the supernatural and miraculous. Psalm 119, 133, the psalmist says, direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Does God direct us? Yes, yes he does. Galatians 1, 3 to 5 says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might do what? Deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 2 Timothy 4, 17 to 18, Paul says, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be fully preached through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was what? Delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, listen. When it seems like nothing is happening or even going to happen that would change our situation or circumstance, this is God's domain where he does what cannot be done otherwise. And when something supernatural is in order, God is still able to do so. And he's still faithful to deliver and direct his people. Now, maybe you're here tonight, and some of you are, and you feel like it's over. 
It ain't over till it's over. Our God is a God of miracles. And we have to remember through this chapter that what he did last time may not be what he does the next time as David sought the Lord the two times the Philistines gathered in the Valley of the Giants. But listen, when a miracle is needed and it's within his will, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And maybe you need the sound of the angels in the mulberry trees tonight. Well, listen, I don't know if God's going to do that for you or not, but what I do know is God is always up to something, even and maybe especially when we can't see anything. God is on the move. God is working on your behalf. And I like to remind us occasionally, and I'll do so tonight, that God has done more for you that you don't know than you do know. He is watching over you every night. He is protecting you all day long. The enemy only comes, according to Jesus in John 10, 10, to steal, kill, and destroy. First Peter 5, 8 says the devil roams the earth like a roaring lion, seeking whom he what? He may devour. God has protected you. God has cared for you. He is watching over you. And when miracles are in order, he can deliver and direct your path because that's what he's all about. Even when we may have wavered between the declaration and destination, God is still faithful. And he is faithful and ready to pardon to his people. And that's where we'll say a final amen. amen.